hated this course. Worst course to ever exist. I'm just saying I had a lot to say on the course evaluation for that one. What is up, people of the internet? My name is Avery, and I've just finished my second year of electrical engineering at UBC. But throughout my second year, I always wonder what second year was like for all the other engineering programs at UBC. So I reached out to a bunch of people, and in this video, we'll be covering almost everything you need to know before heading into second year computer engineering. Timestamps will be in the description below if you want to reference certain parts of this video again in the future. And without further ado, let's dive into second year computer engineering at UBC. Hi, my name is Jocelyn, and I just finished my second year of computer engineering at UBC. I really like hardware. I came into UBC wanting to do mechanical engineering and then decided that I hated CAD, but really liked electrical stuff. And so for the most of my first year, I was debating between doing CPEN or ELEC. And at the end, I think I wanted the specialization CPEN because it like specialized more in what I actually wanted to do, which is stuff with computers, designing chips, optimizing CPUs and GPUs and all of that fun stuff that comes with being able to specialize in something like that. So that's ultimately what won out. So I took five courses each semester and 10 courses total. I think most of my courses were four or five credits though, so it was probably the equivalent of a six or seven course course load in hours of school attended. CPEN 211 is known as the hardest course that you will ever take as part of your degree, but I don't think that's actually true. I think the course got a lot easier in the recent years and it's been taught so much that the professors know the course very well. And when they teach it, you don't get the feeling that they don't know what's happening as you do in some of the other courses that CPEN offers, which are more new experimental courses. I had a MacBook Pro and it could not run the software you needed for CPEN 211. And I had to download a virtual machine, which destroyed my LAM. So if you have a MacBook, I highly recommend you go into the computer lab, which is available at all hours and just sit in front of a computer and do your work on that computer. That's what I did every Monday because my lab was on Tuesday. That's when lab, my lab was due. So every Monday I would sit in the computer lab for maybe seven to 12 hours and just grind out the entire lab all in one go. And it just, it worked out for me because I was like, Mondays are just for the labs and I got it all done and I was free for the rest of the week, but they're definitely difficult. So we had one midterm, one final. I found that they were very fair exams, actually. They didn't throw a lot of curveballs at me and I thought it was, yeah, they were fair. Hated this course. Worst course to ever exist. I'm just saying I had a lot to say on the course evaluation for that one. CPEN 221 is a uh, kind of messed up course in that it takes all these random topics that it thinks you should know as part of as programmers and kind of jams it into this one five credit course. And they teach it in such a way that it jumps around a lot. So you never really know what next you're gonna learn. Like we learned how to leave comments in code and next time we were learning about concurrency and how did we get from this part, documentation to concurrency? Couldn't tell you, it was just one lecture was documentation, the other one was concurrency. They have these horrible things called LPTs, which they sit you into an exam room and you have 90 minutes to code up the answer to like a leak code question. It was so poorly done. We had one LPT where they messed up the entire question and then we had to redo the entire LPT again on a different Friday. Also, the LPTs were Fridays from four to six. So everyone hated it. Nobody wanted to be there. It was just, ugh. So there is a midterm and there's a final, but they're all multiple choice conceptual questions on stuff like anything they covered in the course. So basically anything everywhere is just on the books. Oh, the course is taught in Java, by the way. CPEN 281 is technical communications, 
which is the writing course that's mandatory for all engineering students, but this one is specialized for CPEN students. For this course, I want to give huge props to the professor because she could tell that none of us really wanted to be there, and she did her best to make sure that the class was really interesting to us. So the class basically centered around writing this research proposal with three other people and it's super chill. You get to research basically whatever you want in related to computer engineering. So my team and I researched like robotics bees and their impact on agriculture and their feasibility and their ethics. There is a midterm and a final for this course. Math 220 is mathematical proofs, and it's taken not just by CPEN students, but by math majors, comp sci students, basically anyone looking to get into computing in general takes this mathematic proof course. And I had an interesting experience with this one because I had taken honors differential calculus and honors integral calculus in my first year, which is a proof-based calculus. So it was a very difficult course last year, but it really prepared me for Math 220. I think I already built a lot of those skills that Math 220 tries to teach you, but it definitely is a big learning curve. And I remember spending like 20 hours a week on my math homeworks last year. So it's a big learning curve, I would say, getting adjusted to proofing things. We had two midterms, if I remember correctly, and one final. The first midterm was okay because that was really them introducing you to proofs. So how would you prove that a number is odd? How would you prove a number is even? and sort of basic proofs like that. So I think everyone did relatively okay on that midterm. And the second one was a lot harder and it kind of just assessed you on everything except the last portion of the course. And the final was like the most terrifying thing I've ever walked into. I was so scared for that final because the thing with proofs is that it could they could literally throw anything at you. They could say like, prove that pi is irrational. And you'd just be like, well, like they could ask that, I, I don't know how to answer it, but they, they could. I think the average for that course was a 63, but my prof was really good. He was a very sweet guy. Math 253 was multivariable calculus. It was the same as normal calculus, except like three dimensional. It was completely online, which was fun. I think I bonded a lot with my friends during that time and listened less to Mark talking on the big screen. But I, I think my experience is echoed by a lot of people as well. I know people would go into like lecture theaters and pull Mark up on the big screen and there'd be like 50 people sitting around watching him and taking notes. The professor is Mark and he is a very lovely guy, but he never gets to know you as a person because he's on a screen and there's 700 of you, so he doesn't really care. There was two midterms and one final. I believe the midterms were quizzes, like they were online. So cheating during the midterms, crazy. But during the final, 50% final, and it was very visual is all I would say. <laughs> CPEN 212 is Introduction to Operating Systems. It is kind of the latter half of CPEN 211. Back when CPEN 211 was one big, really ugly course, they split it off and made CPEN 212 mandatory only for CPEN students and not for the elect students. It was a very challenging course. So you get quizzed every lecture. You come into the lecture and there's immediately a 10 minute quiz. Luckily, these quizzes combined only count for 3% of your grade, but it is still depressing seeing like 0.6 out of three on like a lot of your quizzes. Your quizzes are usually on material that was taught last lecture. So you really have to stay up to date or you just throw your quiz grades away. So there were six labs. The labs are split into two parts. They are very heavily programming based on a very, very low level. So one of the labs was Stack Overflow using assembly. Another one was creating a command line interface. We made malloc as one of our labs. We simulated virtual memory as one of our labs. We optimized caches as one of our labs. So it's a very fun course if you know what you're doing. 
I would say 95% of the time you're crying because you don't understand the problem or you did the problem completely wrong and have to redo the problem. The instruction is not super great in this course. And when you ask questions to the professor, they're usually really vague about the specifications. It makes it challenging to do well on this course and you don't really get your grades until very late on in the course, even though everything is auto-graded. I will also say that do not cheat in this course. Everyone can be tempted to do this, but the professor that runs this course is a hawk, literal hawk. He catches so many people cheating. I think like a couple years ago, he caught like, 60% of the class cheating. And I don't know how he does it because we all have the same problem. CompSci 221 is like the infinitely better version of CPEN 221. The CompSci professors are compassionate people. They will extend your deadlines if you have a long weekend. You get tested every week. Each test is worth 5%. It's multiple choice and maybe one coding question. Other than that, super duper chill. I think everyone does very well in this course and it teaches a lot of fundamental knowledge that you need, especially if you're going into a software related role. This course teaches you stuff that is relevant during those coding interviews. So stuff like what's the difference between a linked list and a binary heap? When would you choose one over the other? If I was to take a course to prepare for coding interviews, this would be the course. There were no midterms for this course. There was a final, but it was only worth 20% because the quizzes that were 5% each week added up to 45% of the course. There were labs, but they're very easy labs. I would say I took on average maybe two hours to complete a lab. They're very fun labs and you submit them to be auto-graded an infinite amount of times on this software that they have. So it's super easy to just know when you're finished and you got 100% compared to a course where you have to turn it in and then you don't know if you could have done better. ELECT 201 is introduction to circuits. So a lot of stuff on calculating capacitors, op amps, resistors, in inductors, and transistors, all of that fun stuff. The CPEN students take it in the second term. And I do know one ELECT student that did do it in the second term as well. My professor was a very nice guy. He looked like the Lorax. He talked like the Lorax. He was so kind. He came up to me during my final exam and asked, did you go to your labs? And I was like, yes. And he gave me a hi chu, signed my name on the piece of paper, and then left. He's a very nice guy. In Elect 201, there are some labs. They're usually pretty low stress. Um, the TAs are super helpful. They're not like hounding you to finish right on time. You get two weeks to complete a lab. So if you need extra time, you can always come in anytime during the week to work on those labs. You do need a second year parts kit, but it ends up being very useful for personal projects as well. So I would just invest in them or just buy the supplies individually instead of buying them through UBC. Whatever works, but you do need one of those kits for second year. Our final was worth 50%. It was on web work. And basically what you do is you put in an answer and then you press submit and the professor can limit the amount of attempts that you had. My professor just unlimited attempts on all questions for that exam. And essentially you, you could guess the question, like the numbers if you wanted to. It was also open book exam. So not like he would endorse you going to like stack overflow to search for the answers, but he also won't stop you from looking over past lecture material during the final exam. So I had my laptop open during my final. I had my iPad with all my notes and I think I finished that exam an hour early and I got a hundred. So I would really look at the professor that you have for Elect 201. It really makes a difference in how your experience of this course will be. And I will honestly say that even though my experience wasn't as traumatic as it was for other people, I feel like I really actually learned a lot. Like he taught very well. He wasn't just a freebie who gave away free grades. He taught the concepts very well, and that's why students did very well in his courses. Look for those professors that will help you out. 
Math 256 is ordinary differential equations. The reason why I'm having such a hard time remembering this course is that I went to two lectures and decided that it wasn't worth my time and I didn't go. This is not a shade on the professor. It was just that his teaching style didn't really mesh well with my learning style. So I kind of just learned independently. There's lots of resources on this course, which is so great. If you go on YouTube or anything, you'll just find that professors had uploaded their full courses that they had made videos of during COVID. So you can just go onto any of those YouTube videos and watch the entire thing, which is what I did, and then go and take the exam. We had two midterms and one final. I took Math 302 as my elective, which is my statistics course. So most people in CPAN usually take a statistics elective as their free elective in second year. I chose Math 302 over STAT 256 because STAT 256 didn't satisfy the prereqs for one of the courses that I wanted to take this year. So I would say about course planning, you should really look at what you want to do in third year and what courses you want to do when you take your stats course or any elective course. STAT 256 is the easier stats course. It's gentler and the professors are generally more understanding because it is the easier version of Math 302. Another equivalent to Math 302 is STAT 302. They're the same course, just taught by different professors. So look at your professors and choose whichever one has the higher Rate My Prof rating. My professor was a 1.4 on Rate My Prof. It was fun to learn about probability and all sorts of research that it led into. Yeah, I don't know. There was one midterm and one final for that course. Again, I had a different experience in first year because I took honors calculus and that sat up at least 20 hours of my week each week. So I kind of had a more stressful first year than others would say, I think, which really prepped me for the amount of labs that you will have to do in second year. So that's the big thing between first year and second year. First year, it was assignments, it was exams, midterms, but second year, they really start hammering in those labs. They want you to get all the experience that you can doing real world problems because there's no point in learning the theory if you can't apply it. So doing a lot of labs was the biggest adjustment for me in second year. If your only programming knowledge is from APSI 160, which is the introduction to programming course that all first year end students take, you will need to do a lot more programming by yourself. Highly recommend learning an object-oriented language such as C++ or Java, which are very heavily focused on in second year. And they kind of just assume that you do know how to program already having chosen CPAN. So having that strong base is kind of what the professors already expect of you. I will say that co-op does prioritize grades more than they let on. If you got into CPAN, you probably have some pretty high grades and that almost guarantees you a spot in the co-op program unless you're really, really weird. I think most of the people I know in CPAN got into the co-op program. I would venture to say maybe about 90, 95% of them are in the co-op program. Some of my other friends in other specialties do had less chances to get into co-op. I think it's less your specialty and more the grades that you had in first year getting into that specialty. I thought the co-op program motivated me to find a job only because I was paying for it and I was not about to let my money go to waste. I met with my co-op advisor quite a ton and it's nice kind of having someone to reassure you. She'll do practice interviews with you and it's kind of a calming presence knowing that you have someone there who has to listen to you vent about all of your stressful interviews and how to prepare for them, especially if it's your first time, having that person can be helpful. If you're looking to go into software, you need projects. You need software projects, you need hardware projects, any sort of projects that you have can really help you get a job. For example, I programmed an app and 
that helped me land an interview for a internship at Apple this summer. So if you have those kind of experiences, they set you up for the jobs that you want to get into. So start dreaming big of the jobs that you want to do. If you want to go into robotics at NVIDIA, you should start simulating robotic arms in Gazebo. There's stuff that you can do right now as projects that show that you truly are passionate about what you're gonna get into and that's what will make you stand out against all the other applicants. I am on Subsea, which is human-powered submarine design. What Subsea does is race human-powered submarines in international competitions. So every two years, they switch between going to England, which they went to this year, and going to the US. And we race in naval bases, so it's an army-sponsored competition. So it's usually a lot of fun, and you meet a ton of other teams who are super passionate about naval architecture or the ocean or anything in between. I'm on the electrical team. I'm going to be the electrical team lead next year. We did a computer vision system this year. We moved on electronic steering with Hall effect sensors and designed PCBs. We made our own battery management system. The other thing that I started in my second year was looking into research. I started reading a lot of research papers and I knew that I wanted to experience research. So I started reading a bunch of research papers and trying to figure out what excited me, what I wanted to learn about, and then I just started reaching out to professors and I was so lucky that one of them decided to take me on and that's how I got my research internship this summer. I'm very lucky to be able to work with this professor throughout the year. I've learned a lot both from him and his PhD students and about the process of research and what it's like to be in academia, which I think is a very valuable experience and I highly encourage anyone really to give it a shot and see if you like it because it's not exactly the kind of stuff that you can experience later on in life. Like you're only a university once. I'm building an iOS app. So I had already had a little bit of experience in iOS app development, and I found it really fun to see the app come to life on the screen. And then I decided that, hey, I should try and grow this bigger into a business. And I'm working on really just taking advantage of all the resources that there are for student entrepreneurs and building this app that started kind of as a project as something I really love and learning a lot of new skills along the way. So yeah. The best thing that I did was join my design team in my first year. And I think being in that design team and being around all those people for five, eight hours a week, every week creates a kind of bond. And a lot of upper years gave really good advice to me about courses I should take or strategies in my courses. I think my life would be a lot more difficult if I didn't have that advice. So beyond just the technical experience that a design team gives you, I would say it's really the connection with all of those other friends that you'll make that really makes the experience worth it for me. I've just learned so much from so many other people and I'm really excited to always pass that knowledge on to incoming students onto the design team and it's more valuable beyond just the stuff that you put on your resume. I would say research obviously landed me my research internship. It's cool stuff. I get to mess around with all sorts of cool stuff at a kind of low stakes place. I'm hoping to publish a paper, so I'll be a published author by the end of the summer. Fingers crossed. <laughs> you never really know where all these extracurriculars will lead you. I didn't start any of this stuff expecting to gain what I gained today. So really just keep an open mind and I think just try anything that you think might be even remotely interesting. Like concretely what each experience had brought me, I think Subsea landed me a lot of interviews, a lot of technical experience. I had a lot of bullet points on my resume because of my design team experience. My iOS app that I programmed landed me an Apple interview. And I think I, I made it to the final round of that Apple interview as well. So that was a lot of fun. It's my first time experiencing an interview at a Fang company. And my research internship landed me a job this summer and hopefully will lead me to more experiences. I made really good connections with a lot of people who are very well established in the academia world. 
So doors are opening because I chose to put myself out there and do these extracurriculars. I really believe that if you want it badly enough, you will make time for it. So I think that has really helped me with my time management. I've been able to kind of push down on the hours that I spent on a lab and been able to finish a lab in that time because I put these restrictions on myself because I wanted to do other things. So I would say don't be scared of taking on new opportunities because you think you're going to be too busy. You should always try them, especially for labs. It's really easy to spend too much time on a lab when you should have finished four or five hours ago just because you gave yourself that extra time to finish instead of saying, hey, I have to finish before this time because I have to go do something else. It's kind of imposing that artificial deadline on yourself, which is why so many people procrastinate. It's just, you have to get it done, so you will get it done. I actually really like CPEN 211. I had a lot of fun. Hated CPEN 221. Worst course I've ever taken. To quote Satish, what do you think makes sense? DE1 SOC. <laughs> Um, really like Shariar. Shariar was probably one of my favorites. I'm running through all the profs in my head. Oh, probably Ian Freegard. Math 256, Ian Freegard was my professor. That was the course that I went to two lectures to and never went back to again. I wish I TA'd a course in second year. I think it would have been fun to TA like APSI 160. I know a lot of people that did and I think it would have been fun. There was this one event during E-Week called Sleep that I attended, which was a lot of fun. I think I would really consider doing a LEC over CPEN. Now that I'm doing my third year course selections, there's a lot more reserved seats for LEC students, and they have a lot of the prerequisites that I don't have for courses that I thought would be interesting to take. So I think I might have done a LEC, but also LEC students can't take some of the courses that I really like right now. But yeah, I think I still would have chosen CPEN. And that's pretty much everything you need to know before heading into second year computer engineering at UBC. I just want to say a huge thank you to Jocelyn for helping me with this video and for sharing her experiences in second year. As always, gently tap the like button, hit that subscribe button, and ring that notification bell to notify whenever I release a new video. With that being said, I hope this video brought you value, and I'll catch you in the next one. Peace out.